Good morning. I uh, walked in and looked at the door and the strategy for a global economy, I thought I would come to an investment conference rather than a political <laughs> conference. But I, th I guess as a uh, former investor and, and someone who's always been interested in politics, I'm uh, looking forward in the next era, given the tensions our society now uh, experiences, of showing investors that citizens care about the strategy of global economy just as much as they do. I think we, we have some rebalancing to do as a society. In fact, uh, before we go to our panelists, I, uh, I wanted to try to illuminate a perspective because I think we're, we're on the cusp of change. I think after the 2006 elections, there's a great deal of uh, awakening and awareness. Even if you conduct focus groups in red states, there's a lot of concern about the economy and foreign policy. And uh, one of the themes that I think is very important before people start to zoom in and argue about free trade versus protection is, the, is really what the question of a social contract in America should be about. What is the social design? Uh, I've been somewhat concerned, because I was educated as an economist, that we were always taught that an economy is there as a system of markets to serve society. By the time, and I'll even say this so I'm a little bit nonpartisan, by the time Clinton's people were in power, they were bowing to the bond market and they were restructuring society to serve the economy. And I think that that inversion of, uh, how we say, purpose and intent uh, is somewhat, uh, how we say, uh, a somewhat unhelpful psychology, and, and it perhaps it's time to challenge that. We have uh, a number of themes today and some expert panelists who can talk about, and I thought I'd just try to be brief but get out of there and get out of their way. Uh, I do think that, uh, one could criticize economic theory, but I think that's somewhat missing the point. I think economic theory is fine. It might be that the selective use of economic theory by people of power, rather than the underlying logic itself, is, is the question at issue. And then a couple of our panelists will work on that. More important, what people do with theory, what they, what they do with ideas, and how it translates into action is very, very complicated by the fact that our elected representatives in this era require so darn much money to run and get reelected. In essence, the uh, competition between one person, one vote, and one dollar, one vote is skewed very much towards the latter at the present time. And uh, I know in particular my longtime friend, David Sirota, who's written a book called Hostile Takeover, can speak about uh, those difficulties, and to some extent, that isn't an R versus D kind of issue, because people in both parties, elected representatives, have to survive. So I will ask the question of the panel here at the outset, is campaign for finance reform essential to good trade policy? Uh, the uh, other questions that will arise relate to uh, Alan Blinder at Princeton, who's recently written in the Washington Post and Foreign Affairs, calls offshoring. The traditional models of free trade are somewhat different than the models of people beaming things across the ethernet and, uh, and back and forth. And what Blinder suggests that as many as 70 million people, many who are highly educated, thinks they played by the rules of society are in for a rude awakening in the next generation. And, uh, so, at any rate, uh, let me just, how should I say, uh, move on to our panelists and, uh, and try to come up with a, uh, how should I say, a shaped perspective. We're not here to bellyache. We're here to try to figure out how to evolve. We're in a spot that is painful. There is a huge mismatch right now between a society where the scope of the market which is essentially planet Earth, is much larger than the size of the sovereign domain, in this case, the United States. And, and corporate executives, very powerful corporate executives, corporate executives who raise a lot of money for K Street, are people who are faced with a conflict. They have responsibilities to their shareholders, which are at odds with their responsibilities as citizens. In our society, we tend to dwell on economy, to the detriment of uh, awareness of citizenship, 
But I, I think those people, and I, and I actually believe many corporate executives are very good-hearted people, but we have to restructure the incentives that uh, align executive citizenship with executive execution of their uh, fiduciary duties. At any rate, uh, let's see, where should we start? Okay, Congressman Sutton, other than the fact that I'm from Detroit and the Cleveland Capilliers put a whipping on my Detroit Pistons, I'm really glad to have you here. <laughs> and uh, I know she's from the, the Cleveland area and formerly the district that was, uh, that Sherrod Brown, who's been a big leader in the trade issues. Uh, so you, you got big shoes to fill, but everything I've heard, you're gonna fill them in more. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's a, it's a <laughs> You had to bring up the Cavs, so really, <laughs> still recovering from that. Um, it is truly an honor to be here today to talk to you, and I congratulate you all on this spectacular, spectacular conference that's going on. So important um, to everything that we want to do to change the direction of this country. And I'm so happy to be here to talk about this issue that is something that I care so very deeply about. Um, and frankly, people across America care very deeply about, and Congress and the administration, frankly, need to catch up with how deeply this issue is felt and the concern that is out there surrounding it. You know, unfortunately, this is an issue that's had a devastating effect on the area that I have the honor to represent in the 13th District of Ohio. Um, and it's not just my congressional district, but certainly that's where I begin. Uh, I'm happy to be here with Ralph Gomery, who I had the pleasure to meet with not too long ago in my office and, and discuss these issues and about how we might proceed, um, as well as David Sirota, who has kept us informed about trade um, online and in print for quite some time, and I, it, it's an honor to finally get to meet him. Um, and of course, Thea Lee, who's passion on, on issues uh, affecting working men and women and, and trade uh, is, is frankly uh, unparalleled and uh, I appreciate her participation and, and the value she brings in talking about the effect that these bad policies have had on American workers. And thank you also to Rob Johnson, the moderator, despite that comment about the Cavs. Um, I do appreciate it and, and, and frankly, Rob, I, I would just begin because you posed the question about campaign finance reform. Um, the answer is not only would it be more likely that we would get better trade policies, it would be likely that we would get many better policies <laughs> in many areas <laughs> um, uh, uh, that, that are important to people. Now, as I said, you know, it's hard to begin to talk about trade because there are so many, uh, frankly, uh, impacting things that have resulted from the, the policies we've been following. We in Ohio have lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs since 2000. And of course, three million have been lost uh, nationwide. And 50,000 of those jobs are attributable to NAFTA alone. So when you travel through my district and throughout Northeast Ohio, uh, you, you talk to business owners and workers alike, and they're just reeling from the bad consequences of the policies that have been enacted. And the, no longer does the argument that, um, that, that in theory, you know, we heard at the beginning how this was going to lift everybody up. Um, yeah, I know we laugh only because we could cry, but, um, you know, and, and the reality is, though, it's no longer theoretical. It's no longer hypothetical. We know what the consequences of our actions have been, and certainly that offers us an opportunity to change course. Uh, I had a reporter talking to me uh, not too long ago, and as they were uh, inquiring about the intensity of, of my feelings on this issue and, and how important it was to the election, um, and they said, was there some day, like during the campaign, when you realized that trade was really an important issue um, in the 13th district? And, and I said, every day, every day. So that is sort of what you're dealing with, that there's sort of this disconnect of just how important this issue is. But it's not just 
in Ohio. It's not just in Michigan. It's not just in um, where we have traditionally felt the effects first. And that's one of the things we learned when we got here as a new freshman. Um, this was an issue that was important to the, 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 those who were elected with me who gave this um, Democratic Congress, the Democratic majority um, to this Congress so, and to America, frankly. And the people out there, as, as we know from the election, they know how important it is. And they cast their vote um, with a hope that new leaders would help us change course. They know that, and you know in this room, and, and I know, that if we're given a, a level playing field, that we can compete globally. This is not about being for trade, pro-trade versus anti-trade. It's about the rules of trade and making sure that they're fair and enforceable. And as our policies are right now, they leave our businesses and our citizens, our, our workers, our farmers, our communities at a disadvantage and they're suffering. So we really do need a new trade model. Uh, but I am not against trade. Uh, so that's kind of how they have dismantled this debate in the past. They call you names, they call you protectionists, they say you're, you don't understand globalization. And, um, but, but the truth of the matter is we can look at some of the statistics and productivity is through the roof. Wages are flat. Okay? Um, it, all of the investment in technology that we can make and we should make. Um, all of the investment in education that we can make and we should make. Um, all of those things are important, but unless we also fix the broken system of trade, then new products are going to go the same way. So it's, it's, a, it's not an either or proposition. We must invest in innovation, but we must fix the broken system of trade. And that is where I hope that this Congress will begin to focus. Now some of you have probably heard, or all of you perhaps in this room, that recently there was a, a deal announced between some congressional leaders and the Bush administration uh, involving some of the free trade agreements that are pending right now under fast track, including the Peru and Panama agreement. And there was some excitement initially um, as the announcement came because it was for the first time in a long time we had this uh, idea that labor and environmental standards were going to be written into the free trade agreements. The problem is immediately after the announcement there were those who are benefiting under our free trade, current free trade, free trade system um, that is broken who said, who boasted that the, the, the standards were unenforceable. The other issue to look at is that in 2000 when we passed the Jordan free trade agreement there were labor and environmental standards in that. But what we've seen is that they haven't been enforced despite documented um, cases of, of extreme human rights and, and worker uh, violations. So we're not in a place where any kind of standards are going to be enforced. So it doesn't seem to make sense to me for us to focus our attention on passing more free trade agreements that will continue the bad consequences that we have felt from the, the uh, model that has been in place. And instead, we should look at doing the things that we can to fix the broken system. Stopping the illegal subsidies, dealing with currency manipulation, ensuring the safety of, of products that are produced elsewhere. Uh, just yesterday, the USA Today uh, reported a, a, a story about lead that is in jewelry that our children are purchasing here, or people are purchasing for kids here. Um, one child swallowed a, a charm. It was 99% lead. He died. Died. Um, and so, and China, of course, is objecting to our, our concern and request for regulation on these, these kinds of safety dangers. These are all things that Congress can deal with. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with this. There is no way, and I implore all of you in this room to talk to everybody you know, that this Congress should continue to cede its responsibility over trade and give fast track authority to the administration. Congress has responsibility over trade for a reason.
It's because we're closest to the people. The reality is fast track is what has brought us all of these agreements and frankly puts us in a bad position now because they're going to lay these pending agreements on the table and they're going to say if you don't vote that vote for them then we're in a bad place we've already negotiated this. And frankly on the point of enforceability I'm just going to close with this. If there's anybody out there who thinks that the Peru and Panama agreements are going to be progress because they're going to be enforced with these labor and environmental standards. This administration is also pushing a trade deal with Colombia. The trade deal with Colombia, despite the fact that human rights violations and the murder of labor organizers has become routine. The fact that they're willing to even negotiate and enter into an agreement with Colombia should tell us all that we need to know about their desire to enforce labor standards. Um, not to mention, frankly, sometimes we can just look at home and see how labor has been treated in this country. So with that, I will, uh, I will close and I'm, I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Our next speaker, Ralph Gomery, is a PhD in mathematics and uh, has many, many distinguished academic credentials and awards that I won't go through in detail, but he's currently the president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And he and William Baumol have written a very interesting uh, and uh, I, I would say very innovative book in uh, the realm of national policy and international trade. And uh, I, I think uh, I myself, like I said, being trained as an economist, was very excited when the nation writer William Grider told me about uh, the interviews he'd had with and his readings of Mr. Gomery's work. And uh, I look, uh, I very much look forward to your comments uh, and, and your thinking and, and your leadership in the intellectual realm in the, in the days ahead. Well, I'm very happy to be here and to be part of this uh, distinguished panel and this distinguished meeting. Right? And uh, let's see if this thing works. Right? Yep, there it is. Okay. Let me ease the suspense. I'm going to talk about globalization. <laughs> But I'm just going to make a few basic points. <clears throat> uh, in this era of globalization, the goals of our global corporations and the goals of this nation have diverged. <laughs> countries, what is it countries want from their corporations, their companies? Companies of, countries have always looked to their com companies to be productive and be able to provide productive and high paying jobs that contribute strongly to the national economy. To earn a living today, a person cannot just do it on their own. They have to join an organization, usually a corporation. If you want to make a complex object like a car or a telephone service, you don't do it you have to belong to a corporation. Okay? And the way that you support your family and all that is that you bring home a share of the revenue of that corporation. Okay? So the fundamental social role of the corporation is to enable people to participate in the modern economy. Okay? That's what countries want from their corporations. But it certainly is not what corporations, you know, visibly announce, nor have they ever, right? Corporations have always been heedful of the need for profits, because without the profits, aside from anything else, they go to business. Okay? So corporations focus on profits, and countries want their citizens to be able to participate in the economy. Right? These two things used to work together, because the companies, in order to be profitable, wanted to be productive and efficient, and for a long time they invested 
alongside their American workers and gave them the tools they needed to be productive. For a long time, Americans dug ditches with backhoes, and most of the world dug their ditches with shovels. And that difference is what made America a rich nation. Right? But today, with globalization, it has become possible for U.S. global corporations to pursue their profits by building capabilities abroad and importing the goods and services made there into the United States. And in so doing, they are certainly fulfilling their fundamental social purpose of enabling people to participate in the economy, but most of those people will be in Asia rather than in the United States. And also by so doing, they're building up the productive capabilities of the Asian states and often, though not always, reducing the productive capability of the U.S. It is at this point that the theory of free trade is invoked to say what, that uh, while these actions of corporations are sometimes painful to those who lose their jobs, they will find new ones in time. And the result is cheaper and better goods that benefit consumers so that overall the country comes out ahead. However, <clears throat> this is in fact an incorrect characterization of the theory of free trade. Globalization is not free trade. Free trade owes its deserved appeal to the sound notion that if all countries produce the things at which they are relatively best and then trade the resulting goods and services with countries that themselves produce what they supply best, then the global community and all its people will benefit. But the economic analysis that produces this favorable view of free trade assumes that the productive capabilities of the countries involved are fixed. You're good at this, we're good at this, we make this stuff, we trade, we're all out ahead. That's okay. But globalization is not like that. In globalization, the productive capabilities change. In Asia, they're changing rapidly. So the fundamental uh, theory uh, does not uh, deal with that matter at all. Right? When the US trades semiconductors for Asian sneakers, for example, that's trade, okay? They make some, we make some, they make sneakers, we trade them. Conclusions of economic theory hold. It's good, both countries. But when U.S. companies build their semiconductor plants and R&D facilities in Asia rather than in the U.S., then that's a shift, a change in productive capability, and neither economic theory nor common sense asserts that that shift is automatically good for the United States. And therefore, since globalization... Oh, oh, oh. I won't be able to get it onto slideshow there, will I? Oh, here we go. If you can get that for me. How do you move this mouse? Thank you. We'll just leave that up there, all right? That's the message. <laughs> okay. Anyway, if you build things abroad, that changes it, doesn't apply, all right? On the other hand, economic theory is not a blank on what happens when productivities are changed, all right? But what happens is not uniformly good for the home country, right? In fact, the picture is Pretty simple, but not that simple. The, the picture is basically this. If you're trading with an undeveloped country, has very little to trade, you can lose jobs to that country and it'll be good for you and for them at that stage. 
But when they start to develop more, right, then the thing gets less beneficial, and when they develop more, it becomes harmful. Right? And that corresponds with the common sense notion, which is much more uh, widespread, which is, oh, we used to lose just low-skill jobs, and now we're losing high-skill jobs. And that's because we're dealing with a much more developed trading partner, and the, theories, the theory, this evil theory, right, says that can be harmful to you. So free trade is uniformly beneficial, but it assumes that nothing changes. Right? When your partner develops, and then you go right on trading, it can actually hurt you. Right? And that may be very well uh, what we are seeing at this time. Right? Now, if the development of your trading partner can hurt you, what can you do about it? That's fundamental. This is the bad news part. Okay. The, if they get better, you may be hurt. What can you do? There's only one real remedy, and that is that you have to become more productive. Right? As soon as you say that, everybody jumps to attention, and they say, we've got to improve our education, and we've got to do more R&D. Right? It's very difficult to improve education. Okay. It is even more difficult to improve education so much that one educated American can outperform four or five educated Asians because that's what you can get for the same wage. Right? So I'm for education, but we cannot possibly uh, change the situation uh, in that way. And similarly, R&D is good stuff, but if you do an R&D and your production facilities are in China, it's not really clear uh, how much of a benefit to, that you have made. So let me go back to my very first remark, the divergence of interest between corporations and their home country. We have to address that. How can we do it? The first thing to do is look at what other countries do. What does Asia do, for example? They certainly have succeeded in aligning the interests of global uh, corporations with their interests. Their interest is high paying jobs, productive jobs. Right? And they basically say to a corporation, your interest is profit, our interest is jobs, come on over. Right? You won't pay taxes. We'll help you build the building. We may even pay the wages of your workers. And we'll give you an underpriced currency. Right? So that it's cheap, cheap for you to buy, cheap for you to import into the United States. Okay? So they make that deal. They trade jobs they want for profits for the company. Right? They're exploiting that difference of goals. Right? And we should do the same thing. Can we do it? We can't make individual deals with corporations. We don't have that kind of bureaucracy. But we do have a corporate income tax. And so why don't we have, say, for example, just to show there is something you can do in these matters, a corporate income tax that's low for those corporations that are highly productive, right? That per American employee produce a lot, right? And normally that goes a high wage. And for the other way around, they should pay a high tax. And this could be made revenue neutral, so it doesn't impact the somewhat strained condition of the budget. Okay? It is in that direction that I think we have to look if we want to affect the situation. It is necessary to align the interests of corporations and of the country. It is not a simple matter of evil male men selling the, company, the country down the hill. Those folks have to do what they're doing. If they didn't, and I know, I served on lots of boards, they would go out of business because their competitors can do it more cheaply abroad. Right? We have to give them the incentive that enables them to keep high value jobs in the United States. And such incentives do exist, but they are not seriously considered at the present time. So let's start to think in those terms and see if we can't realign our corporate interests and our national interests. Thank you very much. As an American and understanding that Dr. Gomery was formerly the research director of uh, IBM, I breathe the real sigh of relief that his PowerPoint program worked. There may be hope for this country yet. Our next speaker is uh, author, political analyst, 
uh, activist and co-head of the Progressive States Network, David Sirota. Many of you know him. Uh, he's been one of the most vigorous and uh, powerful voices on reframing the trade debate, as well as many other things. Uh, I had the pleasure of working very closely with Ned Lamont and his challenge to Joe Lieberman. And uh, after the primary, when it started to look like the other side was getting the better t of us in the uh, realm of the media, we had, to, we had to get back in the game. And our first draft choice was David Sirota, who came in and worked with us and uh, provided a tremendous amount of energy to that campaign. But uh, David, you're someone I've always enjoyed working with, and I look forward to your comments here. Thank you. Um, first of all, it is really an honor to be at this conference and with the people up on this dais here. And it's particularly, I'm particularly excited about it because most conferences in the political realm don't really talk about this issue, even though it is the biggest issue, at least in terms of economics, that this country and this, really this planet faces. Um, you know, the, to me there are two issues that touch every other issue. Campaign finance reform, as, as Rob discussed, and trade and globalization. There's no economic issue. There's really most foreign policy issues that, that do not touch this issue. Obviously, it's called globalization. That means it has global reach. But when I say that most people don't want to talk about this issue, I really, I really can't stress that enough. And the first thing I'll do is just tell you a little story about, about that, that tells that story about how few people want to really discuss this. I, was, um, I used to live in Montana. I just moved to Denver this weekend. And, and before I left Montana, uh, our senator, uh, Max Baucus, who's the chairman of the Finance Committee, which oversees all of these policies, um, he's been under some pressure uh, at home we, uh, through the Progressive States Network and our, and our allies uh, in organized labor, we, we got a resolution passed through the Montana Senate on a 46 to 4 vote telling him not to reauthorize Fast Track. Now obviously, Max Baucus being the senator from Montana gives 900,000 people in Montana a huge seat at the world's economic table. And so when this resolution came down the pike, Max essentially announced that actually he wasn't going to push fast track through his committee so quickly. Now, of course, he didn't, he didn't want to admit that there was a causative relationship between the resolution and his backing, up, backing off doing what he normally does on trade. To, to admit that would be to admit that there was some sort of democratic small d control over over these issues. But that's not the point of my story. What ended up happening was a couple of weeks after this, this happened, he had a big economic conference in Butte, Montana, which if any of you have been there, you would know that Butte is probably one of the country, countries, if not the world's, best physical icons of what globalization has done in a negative sense to our local economies. It's a city that used to be the biggest city between Chicago and San Francisco at the turn of the century. It's a city that now has the largest Superfund site in America in, down, in its downtown. I think it's, I've been told it's one of the only man-made things that you can see from space, the Great Wall of China and Butte's Berkeley Pit. It was a copper mine, and the copper mines have gone to Peru, where they've been able to use all sorts of or lack of labor protections to essentially move the copper industry down there. He had an economic conference here where he brought in CEOs and former US government officials to discuss the benefits of, of free trade. This is sort of the, the sales pitch helped him try to lay the, I think, the groundwork for doing some things that the state of Montana and I think blue collar people all over the place don't want to see happen. This is, we saw this at NAFTA. When, when NAFTA was sold, there was one of these, what, what's called a grass tops campaign, where you've got 
famous icons come in and sell the policy to the local grassroots constituency. And one of the people who was there was Bill Gates. Bill Gates was, well, he was actually teleconferenced in and he gave his speech about how globalization's wonderful and everything's great and Montana should be very excited about, being, about globalization and the potential benefits for Montana. Long story short, too late. <laughs> The audience was allowed to ask questions, and I got up and asked a question. I said, you know, Mr. Gates, you've told us how Montana should be excited about the potential benefits of globalization. Can you explain to us why a state like this should be optimistic that it can attract, for instance, high-tech jobs from Microsoft at a time when you and other people like you have backed trade policies that make it more in your financial interest to hire more workers for lower, lower wages in places like India. When at a time the Seattle Times has said that your middle level management has been told to try to outsource as many jobs as possible offshore. And Bill Gates said to his credit, he said, well actually, to be honest, Montana shouldn't really think that it's going to be the center of, of, of any kind of tech economy. <laughs> and I was actually kind of surprised that he, he was that honest. Uh, and, and I guess I, I appreciate it. Um, but he said that after a long, sort of long-winded winded answer about, about what, what Ralph just talked about, which is basically the great education myth, as I call it. That we can educate our way out of this problem. We can somehow, if everybody in the United States became a PhD, we would suddenly have no problem with job outsourcing and wages would rise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When in fact, all of the data shows that's not true. College educated folks are making less money today. Their wages are going down. There's all sorts of data about how that's not true. And it's obvious why it's not true. Because, again, as Ralph said, you can't one very educated person, one very productive worker can never outwork four or five less productive, less educated workers in most industries. I mean, certainly there are exceptions. And I think what's really great about this moment right now is that we see that the public really understands what's going on in a way that I think the public hasn't necessarily grasped in the past. We are now at a point where public opinion polls show a greater understanding of this issue than I think at any time since, since I've been in politics, and I think at any time in the last two or three decades. I'm just going to read you some poll numbers. In 2004, the PIPA poll found that a majority of Americans uh, are critical of our current trade policy. In 1999, even before we've seen further wage declines, less than one quarter of the public said they wanted to continue NAFTA less than one quarter. Through my work at the Progressive States Network, and we founded the Progressive States Network because we think there's a lot of opportunity not only to address these issues in Congress, but at the state level. Just this year, we saw Nevada, Maine, Hawaii, and Utah pass resolutions saying do not reauthorize Fast Track. Now, I want to read that back to you. Nevada, Maine, Hawaii, and Utah. Now, can you get any more politically diverse than that? Alabama, Montana, Pennsylvania, and Vermont, in those states, one chamber passed the resolution. In Hawaii, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, they've passed bills banning the gover their state governments from signing on to non-tariff clauses in international trade policies without the express consent of the legislature. This is a winning political issue. And it's not just a winning political issue, it's, a, it's one of those great issues where the good politics is good policy. And I want to argue also to close the flip side of this. That if the Democratic Party doesn't realize this, it is going to pay a severe price. And I don't just say that sort of throwing it out there as a theory. Here's a very interesting statistic. 59 of the 88 congressional districts that changed from Democratic to Republican between 1994 and 2000 had incomes below the national average. So just think about that for a second. 
So the lower income districts made up the majority of the districts that gave the Republicans their majority. Which basically, I would say, that's, that's essentially what we know as the you know, Reagan Democrats. People who have, I think, have basically said, neither party represents my economic interest, so I, we are going to vote on other issues. I think the 2006 election showed us that economic issues, if we have candidates who are willing to put them as a centerpiece of their campaign, and if they are willing to take on globalization and free trade, and I, don't, I shouldn't call it free trade, it's not free trade. These agreements are not free trade. These are investor rights agreements. These are protectionist agreements. That, that, that we can continue winning those Reagan Democrats. And I want to close by just saying this. I just said I was going to close, but I'll close with this. <laughs> As it relates to the coming trade deals that come up in Congress, there's going to be a lot of talk about enforceability. And it gets real complicated. Are the provisions in the deal? Are they not in the deal? Are they side deals? What are they? Here's the issue from my perspective. I don't think we can rely on any of these people in our government to enforce any of these issues because right now there is too much money behind not having these provisions enforced. And I think that the people in this town who make trade policy understand that. The fact is right now companies are allowed to sue for their rights under trade deals but unions and environmental groups are not allowed to sue for their rights under trade deals, labor rights, environmental rights. Until we have a trade policy that allows us to enforce us to demand the enforcement of trade, of trade policies that protect human interests, I don't think we'll have a trade policy that works for us. And I think that has to be ultimately the centerpiece of where our advocacy is. Thank you. Well, David, I, throughout the history of knowing you, I've agreed with everything you've said, except I saw LeBron James beat the Detroit Pistons playing one against five. And so I think Congresswoman Sutton would have to agree with me. Occasionally, one person could be more productive Occasionally. than five. <laughs> At any rate, uh, there was an economist years ago uh, who I've lost track of named Herbert Guinness at the University of Massachusetts who wrote some very, very powerful work about economics. But in the preface of one of his books, he said, I'm really here to study the implications of one notion that unlike any other factor of production, you cannot use all of the laws of physics on labor. And uh, I think Thea Lee is the policy director and chief international economist of the AFL-CIO is closer to those people who in some sense we try to abstract away from considering when we create these uh, theories of trade and I'm very happy to have you to bring us back and ground us to what it is that a social system is really designed for. Good morning, everybody. It's a tremendous pleasure and an honor to be here speaking to all of you and on this great panel with uh, such an interesting and diverse group of people, and I've really enjoyed the presentation so far. Before I launch into my talk, I wanted to give one pitch just to make sure I know you've heard it a million times. I hope everybody's planning on going to the Employee Free Choice Act rally today, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. I think the buses leave at about 1.15 and there's box lunches. This should be really, really exciting and invigorating. I know it's a hot day. Uh, there will be bottled water there, I'm pretty sure. Our, our folks, we take good care of everybody. Um, so we'll have bottled water and, and, and box lunches. But this is our first major labor law reform in decades, and it's just so great. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that Betty Sutton and Ralph Gomery said is, and D David Sirota, that globalization is kind of about our daily life. And one of the things in my job at the AFLC, I've been there about 10 years now working on these issues on trade and globalization, is that people always ask me this question, which is, what do you really care about? Do you care about worker rights in other countries for poor, downtrodden workers in developing countries? Don't you really just care about your members and their paychecks and their fat jobs and so on and so forth? And I, I don't actually even understand the question because it seems to me how in the world 
Can I look after the interests of American workers if they're part of a global economy where workers' rights are trampled on and there's no cost and there's no economic consequence to doing so, and in fact, the companies and the countries that engage in repression of worker rights can, in many cases, end up the big winners in the global economy. So it's not one, it's not either or. It's not are we in solidarity with workers around the world or do we care about our members? We can't do the job if we're part of an unfair global economy that doesn't work for anybody, for working people, for working families. And I think, um, so that's why I think the Employee Free Choice Act, standing up for the rights of workers in this country to organize a union, is part of standing up for a global economy, a set of rules that will make all of us, um, allow all of us to, to be proud of the global economy that we live in. So my job today is clean up batter and to maybe sketch out a strategy moving forward for the global economy. And I think I agree with what a lot of folks said, that we find ourselves right now at an extraordinarily interesting moment in the trade debate. I think we're poised on the brink of some enormous potential gains that people are waking up to the problems. The old tired rhetoric of free trade doesn't really work anymore. It doesn't work in the political realm. And even within the economic, academic economic debate, there's a glimmer of hope and awakening. But it's also a moment full of challenges and great difficulties. And so I want to go back and forth the good news and the bad news. So the good news is that we're beginning to win some of the intellectual debate about trade and globalization. And I, I have to say that I think we've made some real concrete gains in the conversation with Congress. And both Betty Sutton and David talked a little bit about the deal. And I don't want to get real deep into the deal. And I'd say a couple of things. One is that the Democratic majority in Congress is far from perfect or problem free, with the possible exception of Betty Sutton. <laughs> but it is one million times better than the lying crooks, incompetent crooks, that uh, held us, our country hostage for the last 12 years. <laughs> and I say that because I deal with them all the time. I deal with them, and, and now we're having, you know, we're having hearings on interesting issues. We're able to introduce and talk about things like the Employee Free Choice Act. We're talking about a new trade policy. We have a long, long way to go. Uh, and all the issues that have been raised are totally legitimate. But it is important that Democrats are trying to take the reins and saying, we need to do something different. We need to put labor and environmental protections at the center of our trade policy, not out in the back door uh, in the, the outhouse, where is, which is where it's been for a long time. But let me, um, let me summarize how I see the good news quickly, because I don't have a whole lot of time. But intellectually, even the top drawer academic elite, and I put Ralph Gomery in that group, <laughs> uh, many of them reluctantly now conceding that, gee, we do maybe need to think about the distributional impact of trade and globalization, that that's not something that we can solve just by throwing a few buck bucks at the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program or giving some lip service to education. But in fact, there may be something really massive happening, a massive attack on the middle class in this country that is exacerbated. The bargaining power of working people is constantly undermined by globalization, used as a tool to, uh, they call it to, to flight inflation. You know, you keep prices down, you keep wages down, there's wage discipline. What does wage discipline mean? It means that you can't afford health care to send your kids to college. That's what wage discipline means. And we use the pressure of the global economy to enforce that. Um, second thing that's really interesting, I don't know if any of you, I'm going to recommend an article to you in Business Week last week by Mike Mandel. I think it was called something like The Real Costs of Globalization. And it was just a startling article about the uh, statistics that we use to, to inform ourselves about whether we're doing pretty well in the global economy, whether we have a good, healthy, strong economy here in the United States and we're really muddling along just fine, or whether we're in tough shape. And of course, we in the labor movement never look at this economy as being particularly strong. We've had wage stagnation for about 20 years now, so that your average American worker, median American worker, doesn't earn more than he or she did 20 years ago. 20 years of globalization, productivity growth, technological innovation, massive economic growth, and those benefits aren't getting to the average worker. But, um, but this article basically said that the, the very way that we calculate imports and calculate the price of imports may be, in fact, clouding 
our picture of globalization, that we have shadow GDP growth, shadow productivity growth, that where we, we've exaggerated the, the price of imported goods, and we are, we are vastly underestimating the loss of manufacturing capacity in this country, that this is not a healthy, the U.S. is not healthy competitively in the global economy. It's a really interesting article and could help basically create some sense out of the anecdotal the world that we live in, that I live in, talking to working people, to unions, to members, plant closings, people who are out in the real world know the devastation that plant closings and globalization have caused, and yet the, the statistics haven't really shown that. And the, the third thing that is interesting is these new issues, and I think Betty Sutton talked about this a little bit, but the inadequate global regulatory framework for things like drugs, toys, food, pet food. And m lately in the, the news, there's been an article pretty much every day. Today in the, in the New York Times, on the front page, there was an article about toys coming from China made with lead paint. Uh, and there was one about a fake eyeball that turned out to be filled with kerosene. Nice thing to give your kid. Um, and the reason I think that that debate is interesting is that it, it takes the ideology of free trade, which is that the ideology of free trade, free markets, globalization is a panacea that everything good happens from free trade, which fetishizes the low price. Getting something cheap is like next to godliness. That that's the, the key thing that you need to, to do is to get it cheap. And it doesn't really matter what it is or how it was produced or what the cost, the social cost of production might have been. But if you think about it in terms of the product safety, that's obvious, I think. So parents are asking themselves, can a toy be too cheap if it's made with lead paint or filled with kerosene? Uh, there's been a s s scandals in Panama and Haiti where hundreds of people have died because of tainted cough syrup. There was some smart entrepreneur in China who realized that glycerin is kind of expensive to put into cough syrup, but antifreeze is a lot cheaper, this diethylene glycol, and hundreds of people died because he got away with it for a long time, and it took a long time to trace back to where that actually came from. But the point is that you have, not only do we need to strengthen our national regulatory system, which is being gutted by the Bush administration and the conservatives, but we haven't even begun to think about global regulation in an intelligent way. And I, I want to make this a segue into the concept of labor rights, worker rights, international worker rights, because it's the same mentality that says, do whatever it takes to get the price of labor lawyer and confuses essentially efficiency with exploitation. I think every time we buy something cheap you ask yourself is it cheap for a good reason or a bad reason. Maybe it's cheap because somebody was really innovative and they had a great technology and they're really smart and they didn't take a big profit on it. Maybe it's cheap because a kid chained to a loom made it and worked a hundred hours a week and had no safety uh, protections. And in the context of the global economy, we haven't come to terms with that. And we're, we're called protectionists when we say we care how the goods are made, who makes them, whether their fundamental human rights are being protected. That's called protectionism in Washington. But I think when we think about what kind of global economy we all want to live in, you have to say that that is a bottom line, an absolute um, crucial first step. It's not the only thing we need to do to fix the global economy. Uh, because obviously even having a perfect worker rights system is not going to end poverty or abuse of workers, it's not going to close the trade deficit, it's not going to bring all the American jobs back. But if you don't do it, you live in a world of incredible brutality where workers are so vulnerable. And you think about how vulnerable an American worker is without a union going into a workplace. And then think about a young woman, uh, illiterate, in a maquiladora, in an export processing zone somewhere where she not only doesn't have a union but can't really even vote. Uh, when her, her rights are trampled. So, to me, the point about the wor worker rights is incredibly important because it's like arms talks. This is one of the ways that our government signals to other governments what our priorities are in the trade realm. And so when we say we need to put this at the center of our trade discussions, it's a way of saying we care. And it actually, I just have to say, I've been in Washington for 16 years now, and it's actually working. That's the good news part of it. The good news part is that we have put worker rights at the center of the trade debate, and I actually get visits every single week from foreign governments, foreign unions, the Bangladeshis, the Colombians, the Peruvians, the Ecuadorians who want to come and talk about 
bringing their labor laws into conformity with ILO standards about how, what it is, how they're treating their unions, what the rights are, and we're in contact with the unions um, in those countries and trying to be in solidarity with the unions and take their, their demands, their concerns, their obstacles that they face and translate them into the Washington policy debate. So let me just sum up in 10 seconds um, but th that in the short term, we're faced with these free trade agreements uh, that are of varying degrees of problematicness. But the top priority for us is to stop the Korea and Colombia trade agreements. As Congresswoman Betty Sutton said, the Colombia deal is with a horribly brutal place where workers are assassinated when they try to exercise their right to organize. We can't protect worker rights there with any labor chapter. The Korea agreement is a tremendously imbalanced agreement in terms of market access. It will devastate our auto industry and probably steel as well and fast track is our top priority. So we're putting a lot of energy into killing those deals and we're, we're doing everything we can to, um, to keep Democrats united against those bad trade deals. A big challenge looming in the medium term is the Doha Round, the World Trade Organization. Now the, the multilateral realm is important to trade discussions. It, this is where a lot of the important conversations ought to be happening, but these talks are so far off kilter that we aren't even talking about any of the things that are most important to getting the global trading system, not to mention the U.S. trade system, uh, in order. We, worker rights is not on the agenda. We're not actually allowed to say what's called the L word at the WTO because it's not considered a trade issue. Currency manipulation is not on the agenda. And asymmetric tax treatment, and uh, Ralph Gomery mentioned very quickly about um, taxes, we have a, a very irrational and unfair uh, international tax system where currently we actually pay, you pay, out of your tax dollars, you pay companies to move our jobs offshore faster. It doesn't have to be that way, but we have, we, we have written that into our tax system and now it is part of the WTO. So all those things that we need to be talking about, we're not talking about, and the, um, the development aspect of the current WTO talks is unfortunately a little bit of a mirage. So I'm out of time and uh, look forward to seeing all of you at the Employee Free Choice Act rally. But I think that we can, if we work together, build a powerful political movement that can demand uh, a sensible, fair set of rules, both at the national level and at the multilateral level, that has a conscience as well as a pragmatic approach. Thank you so very much. Look at myself. Wait, wait a minute. These people have clean environment. They have maternity leave and paternity leave and pensions and we're going to get rid of that and turn everybody into Indonesian. It's all going to be better. And Mike, I, I just said, better for whom? He and I didn't drink or travel much together after that. Uh, one of the, when uh, Bob Borsage conceived of this panel, uh, when we talked about uh, setting up one of the people that we had considered bringing in but for reasons of health couldn't join us, was uh, Chalmers Johnson, who's written a trilogy of books, the last of which is called uh, Nemesis, Empire Versus Democracy. And one of the themes that Chalmers, uh, in talking about joining the conference, explored, and, and I guess I'll start off the question period and ask my, I'll pick on my buddy David Sirota. In this realm of global trade policy, military policy is not a separate compartment. Notice I didn't say national defense, because military can be national offense as well as defense. But to what extent is the American taxpayer paying for military empire, which in essence reduces the risk premium of international commerce and facilitates foreign direct investment, and therefore the outsourcing of American jobs? The, the short answer is, I think we're paying a lot. We, I mean, to me, the, the, how much we subsidize outsourcing is only one piece of the puzzle, right? There's direct subsidies for job outsourcing, which is basically through our tax structure. We have a tax structure that literally incentivizes sending jobs abroad. I think to Rob's point, if, if, or to his question, one of the other questions we need to ask ourselves is how much does our trade policy do damage to our own national image 
which is obviously inherently related to our national security. Let me put that into more concrete terms. If you have a trade policy that is perceived to help brutal dictatorships benefit and oppress workers, you are damaging your national image and creating, helping fuel anti-Americanism throughout the world. So I'd say that, was, that would be an indirect way that our trade policy fuels this national security, this broader national security problem we have. And not to sound like a broken record, but that is again why I think the key here in this, in this debate, which has so many different facets, is to focus on how we can strengthen ourselves to fight for the right things, to create a better equilibrium. One of the things I think our, our, the progressive movement sometimes doesn't focus enough on is taking that ethos of the right, the pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and figuring out how to use that for ourselves. Meaning, we ought to be focusing on policies that allow us to fight back. The Employee Free Choice Act, at its heart, helps strengthen our sides, our workers' ability to negotiate on behalf of themselves. A trade policy that would allow unions and environmental organizations the same rights to sue an international court for the enforcement of, of labor rights and environmental rights is a policy that strengthens ourselves. We cannot trust anybody I think, except for Betty Sutton, <laughs> in Washington to really enforce what we need to enforce. I mean, if, if you think that Rahm Emanuel, who was the architect of NAFTA in the House, or that a President Hillary Clinton with Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin is going to enforce the kinds of things we need to be enforced, then I have a piece of real estate to sell all of you. <laughs> In Montana? <laughs> Let's uh, go to questions. Uh, we're over time. Oh, we're over time. Oh, the next oh. panel is coming in. I see. Okay. Um, thank you all. It